This is a podcast about one woman's mission to help entrepreneurs and business owners write better business books. Each week, we tackle your writing excuses, because there are excuses too, and help you beat the blank page of doom so that you can write the book that will grow your life and your business. Now, here's your host, Vicky Fraser. Hello, and welcome to uh, 1000 Authors Show. My name's Vicky Quinn Fraser, and this is my husband, Joe. Hello. <laughs> but the reason that we just did that is because Joe was once more mocking me for my introduction before I'd even got the words out of my mouth. So, so there we go. So Joe had to do it. Introduced. Yes. Um, hi. Hi. How are you doing? I'm all right, thanks. Good. How's your day been? Uh, it's been a bit strange. I've been at an industry event. Oh, event with people. yeah with people i've been talking to people i've been chatting about robots and oh, that's cool, automation and stuff and it was kind of cool robots is cool are they going to take over the world are they going to become our overlords are we, are we all doomed yeah pretty much cool can they jump and play football no well then what's the use of them i'm talking more about the kind of robots for for making stuff like you know cars and like tea, Things. making tea, making me tea. No, not that kind of robots. Industrial automation robots. Then I repeat, what's the use of them? <laughs> making things. I want a robot butler. Make damn it, it. making the things. <laughs> no, I... no robot butlers yet. Oh, okay. There are, there, are, there are cobots though. Cobots are a thing. What's a cobot? It's uh, so most robots you need like lots of shielding and protection and stuff, so they don't like get out and tear your head off when you get too close. Um, Hang on, wait, <laughs> no, wait a minute. Is that something that happens a lot? Well, they, they have to shield them because they're big, like strong, powerful things, and they're doing like big, heavy stuff. So um, they don't, they don't let people just like wander into the area and get minced. Because they won't stop if, if you're in the way. Because they won't stop if you're in the way. Okay, fair enough. So a cobot is a thing that will stop if you're in the way. Oh, why is it called a cobot? Because it's a collaborative robot. You're allowed to be next to it. Well, I... It's not like any time in a cage raging. I, <laughs> I, I propose a motion to call the other ones death bots. Death bots. And these ones, I don't know about cobot. Um, I don't know. Some of the manufacturers have gone so far as to put like iPhone screens on them so that they have like animated eyes that look at what they're doing. Honestly, it's a thing. I think that is both amazing and super creepy. Yeah. So, I love you, it. so you get little cobots that are a little stand with two arms and they've got a little screen with eyeballs on them that look at things that they're doing. And that's what you saw today? Uh, some of it, yeah. Oh, that's very cool. Okay. Um, so what are you reading at the moment? I've got a problem, see, because mm. I finished my book, which was the third David Gemmell novel in the Troy series, last night, mm. just as I was falling asleep. So I haven't actually started reading anything else. Mm. So I'm a bit stumped. But we are watching on Netflix The Wheel of Time. Oh, yeah. Do you, re regular listeners, <laughs> will remember that for about 14 years of this podcast... Joe was reading the Wheel of Time series of books, which consists of 4,237 volumes. It's 14 volumes averaging half a million words each. Holy shitballs. Or something like that. It's ridiculous. It's, it's mental. Okay, it's a, lot of, it's a lot of story. Yeah. Um, and Netflix have made it into a, a ten TV part, <laughs> ten part, uh, TV series. A 10 series? A ten, no, a, a 10 episode. Oh, is, is it just one? Well, they've only one they've, shot. they've only got one season so far. I'm it's, hoping, but I mean, there are some there are some like sensible breakpoints in okay. the book series. It's really good. I'm really enjoying it because I have not read the books, so I'm watching I'm watching the series without having any preconceptions at all, mm. other than expecting it to be epic fantasy. And I can see some similarities with Game of Thrones and production values and mm -hmm. filming choices and things. But I like that because I think that the production values on Game of Thrones were superb for the most part. Also, Lord of the Rings. There was yeah. you know. Like epic. There's lots of lots of scenery and lots, lots of, of lots yeah. of ch being chased through the woods and. And I um, like the title credits as well because uh, I loved the Game of Thrones title credits and mm. this is not it's not it's not the same but it's uh, it's got. This is the, this is it. the wheel weaving as the wheel wills. The wheel we the wheel weaving is okay cool, um, <laughs> so <laughs> so I have no preconceptions but I'm really enjoying it so far and I've seen some. Um, more less favorable reviews like people being like oh it's like a low rent game of thrones and i'm like i really like it it's it's a bit weird because having read the you know nine million words of the story watching it on telly they are kind of they're, they're moving at a pace they're, they're shifting 
Well, I mean, I, we I were talking about to. yeah, we were talking about this last night, the other night, weren't we? Because because I, I I am really annoying to watch TV oh, with. I'm Jesus. really irritating to watch TV with. Super annoying. I'm really irritating to watch films with as well. But I was like, oh, is this in the book? Is that in the book? Is this, does this happen in the book? <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> but we were. <laughs> Who's he? Where's he from? What's he been in before? Hang on a minute, I've got it. IMDb that guy. Oh no! But the thing is, though, if I see somebody that I recognise, I have to look them up because otherwise, I will not be able to watch the rest of the thing. Because I'll just be like, where have I seen him? Where has he been you, before? If you see somebody who's been, you recognise from somewhere, I can't watch the rest of the thing either because we've got to stop at that point and watch you Google for a bit. I'm very sorry <sighs> that I'm outrageous. like this. <laughs> anyway, are you enjoying it? The Wheel of Time thing? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. I really like it because it's super diverse as well. It is very diverse. Yeah, and I really like the characters. Uh, I'm very easily pleased when it comes to films and things, so there's probably loads of people being like, oh, there's all sorts of problems with it, and I'm just, like, just watching it and enjoying it. So that's what Joe and I are watching at the moment. Joe's reading nothing until later, I guess. Um, and I am reading Dress Your Family in Cordroy and Denim by David Starris, mm-hmm. which is another collection of his essays and is making me snort out loud um, quite often. Really, I really love his writing so much. Sure. Um, He's just, it's just exquisite. Um, And I am also just about to start reading The Art of Gathering by Priya Parker, who I heard interviewed on Brené Brown's podcast a few months ago and loved what she had to say. And so I, um, I finished that. What, what What does The Art of Gathering entail? Well, it's all about why and how we meet like in groups of people. Okay. And what did you think of it? For a terrible minute there, I thought you were going to start collecting something. <laughs> it's like, oh, Jesus, no. Please like no. the opposite of Marie Kondo. Or yeah. <laughs> it's like, here's, mm, collect some things and put them in your house. It's like, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Already tripping over shit everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> No, it's about it's about how we meet and why it matters. I think I think how we meet and why it matters is the um, tagline, is the subtitle, right? And so she like on the podcast on the Brené Brown's podcast when she was interviewed, she was talking about weddings that she'd been to and ones that were brilliant and ones that were less perhaps um, mm-hmm. good for the people there and like how you can have gatherings that make that make everybody feel welcome and that just make it amazing, you know? Okay. So it's, and, and so I was just, oh yeah, because I am super socially awkward. Like I'm really socially awkward. And so I kind of love the idea of having people come to my house, but when they're actually here, I'm like, <laughs> I, I don't know what to do. And so, um, so the idea of throwing a party or something makes me both want to run screaming and also makes me want to do it really well. Um, and okay. I remember being really anxious when we got married as well because I was like, I want it to be amazing for everybody. Um, but also, I have no idea what I'm doing. And um, people seem to have fun. We just made it really short. That's how we did it. Yeah, we, we just. We got married at 4 p.m. <laughs> got married at 4, drunk by 7, <laughs> bed by 9. Yeah, yeah that's, that's how we got around that. I think people enjoyed it. So, yeah, and I wanted to read that because also I think she talks about the art of gathering on Zoom as well because obviously she was being interviewed during the pandemic and sure. people were gathering in different ways. And so. Yeah, I just think it's a really interesting. Okay, idea. that's cool. Mm. I'd, I'd, I'd like, yeah, if there's if there's mechanisms for making people welcome at mm. gatherings and engine- engineering good gatherings, then I'm, uh, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, and I thought it could be really useful for like corporate meetings and stuff. I was going to say, does it cover like things that aren't social? I think so. Yeah, yeah, she does. She covers all sorts of things. So yeah, because like most, and this is like from my extensive personal research, most meetings are a boring waste of time they really are um and i just think i just think it's it's a little bit enraging because your time is literally priceless you cannot get it back and if somebody is going to ask me to go to a meeting it damn well better be worth my while to go there um like whatever whatever it's for because and i want to enjoy it as well and there's no reason why corporate meetings shouldn't be enjoyable you know um because otherwise People don't pay attention and stuff. So, so yes, I think it's going to be a good book. I will pass it on to you. Okay, done. cool. Um, but yeah, this week at the Dingle, we've got ceilings, mate. Ceilings. We have ceilings. We have. We did noggins last week. We did ceiling structure the weeks before, and then this weekend, just gone. We spent two days with oh. our arms above our heads at full stretch, and now neither. Are, we've both got tiny T Rex arms now. Yeah. <laughs> 
But yeah, Joe, Joe can't lift his arms up. <laughs> He's just sitting here with his arms dangling by his sides. <laughs> we put a lot of ceilings up. We did the bathroom um, and then we did the room below the bathroom, yeah. which also got a new structure. And We've done it with wood wool, which is, it's like wood shavings glued together with lime. It's really eco-friendly. Yeah. Um, it's nice and, it's kind of heavy and nice and sound absorbing and it's soft um and it's great for plaster sticking plaster it's got a really good key for plaster so it's basically plasterboard but it's lime plasterboard yeah plasterboard for lime yeah for a breathable house yeah nice stuff i thought it was really nice to work with it was easy to cut it was a bit dusty but it's easy to sweep up and it wasn't i really liked it yeah yeah. it was was, was like warm and pleasant to to handle so it was about twice as expensive as like cheap bog standard plasterboard yes it was at least twice as expensive as just plasterboard but drywall for those of us in the uh, in the states yeah drywall it's like wall. It just makes me think you could punch through it. I don't think you could punch through a wood wall. No. You would slice your knuckles. The, thir- the, the, the thicker stuff for the ceilings, you wouldn't know. No. But yeah, we're going to do the walls up in the bathroom next, aren't we? Yep. Very excited. We are. We do now feel like we are getting somewhere. We've almost got like a blank room yeah. with which to put a bathroom in, rather than having like all of this... Like first fix stuff to do. We've almost got a nice, clean, blank, empty room. But most excitingly, we can now light the fire and turn the heating on, and the heat stays mostly in the room instead of leaving through the roof. Yeah. And do you know what? I saw evidence of that this morning when the frost was still on on the roof when I came back from my nice. run instead of having melted off because all the heat is leaving the house. That's so. cool. And we haven't even got any insulation in yet, so no. We'll throw throw a foot of insulation in the ceiling, and we'll throw half a foot in the in the. Yeah. The floor. And that's going to be amazing. That'll make a big difference. Anyway, what are we talking about this week? I have no idea. Literally, we've sat down, we've talked nonsense for nearly 12 minutes now. I think that's okay, though. People come okay? for the nonsense. Is that, is that why people are here? Yeah. Okay. But what are we talking about? We're talking about reading like a writer. Reading like a writer? Yeah. I mentioned this last week and you look baffled. Do you know, how do you, do you know how, what? How writers words? read? <laughs> Readers write. Yeah. Uh, what? Do you, what does that mean to you, read, reading like a writer? I would imagine it means paying attention to how the craft of writing has been done rather than just reading a thing and, you know, it being a story, but reading a thing and looking at the structures and the pacing and the the choice of, of phrasing, whether it's, you know, tense or warm or, you know, the emotion that's conveyed in it and, and understanding that. And then, I don't know. Reading cool. lots of different people so that you gain a wider experience yeah. and then uh, being a bit more intentional. Yeah, basically just, we can go now. That's it, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. Um, so, yes, I mean, that is, yeah, pretty much it. But I'm going to go into a little bit more detail. A little bit more stuff. detail. Yeah. Um, and I promise as well, I promise I'm not going to ruin reading for you because I suspect that your answer was drawn from, you know, being married to me who is a writer and a teacher of writing and so you know a lot more about this than most people right um but i suspect that some people when they hear about reading like a writer might get flashbacks to boring english classes when yeah do you have to do it with a like a highlighter pen and write things in the margin you don't have to you can do um but yeah i promise i'm not going to re ruin reading for you um because i read like a writer and i still read like a reader and i still love reading So, um, but I just am a little bit more intentional about it. And I also apply this, by the way, this is not just about books, like physical books. It's also about podcasts and stories and films and TV series and plays and like literally anything, you know, that that we consume in in terms of a kind of storytelling or informational way. Okay. Like the, the, the back of boxes. (laughs) <laughs> there's, there's some really good stuff on there if you keep an eye out for it anyway so thing the first um just keep reading like you always have done so you don't have to read any differently like you don't have to physically change the way you read you don't have to read word by word and like with your finger pointing on the page um and kind of and kind of ruin it what why are you making that face because <laughs> we're not on the video <laughs> cool so joe was doing the eyebrow dance then <laughs> okay so i don't have to use i don't have to point my finger at the book no, uh, but if you if that is how you read, then continue reading like that. Um, <laughs> but you don't have to like, because when we read, we don't read word by word. Right. We we read by looking at the whole, you know, chunks of the paragraph, and our brains fill stuff in. Yep. So we don't read word by word, letter by letter. So that's what I'm saying is we don't have to we don't have to read any differently. Okay. Um, and just kind of think about why you read at the moment. So 
you tend, unless you're reading purely for pleasure, like fiction purely for pleasure, we read to understand something better, right? To find out more information about it. Yes. That's that's presumably why you read stuff. Well, I, I read a lot of stuff that I just enjoy. So I, I read a lot of nonsense books, to be honest. Yeah, but if you're reading like an article or something for work, then it's usually to find something out or yeah, learn yeah, more about sure. it. And maybe you take notes on it sometimes? Yes. Yeah. Um, and sometimes we'll deliberately go out and find a specific book or article or whatever that'll help us learn more about something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's a bunch of stuff that we kind of all naturally do. Um, you know, we, we, we might seek stuff out, we might have stuff given to us. And, and in my experience, writers and other people who kind of call themselves creatives, we tend to be like sponges. We absorb a lot of stuff from the outside world. Some of it is deliberate and some of it is by accident, but basically everything we see and hear and read and experience tends to feed back into our writing one way or another. Mm -hmm. So we're constantly collecting ideas and sometimes from really odd places as well, like packaging, like I said, or tube station ads mm -hmm. or even birthday cards. Like, cause Joe's really good at writing birthday cards and like Christmas labels and things. And I always keep them and use them as bookmarks. And so you're, you're just, you write little clues so Joe, in um, in his Christmas presents labels, when he wraps me a Christmas present up, the label will contain some sort of a clue as to what is in the package usually, won't it? Mm, okay. Did you not, do you not do that? I haven't really noticed that connection. Do you not do that consciously? <laughs> not really. That's really funny because the one that I've got in my as my bookmark at the moment, I think it says something like, um, beautiful Vix, which is really lovely. Um, and then may the odds always be in your favour. And I'm pretty sure that was a set of really nice Dungeons and Dragons dice. Uh, okay. Yeah, so, and I didn't know that you did it unconsciously. I hope I haven't just ruined it. Well, I mean, that, that one sounds pretty conscious, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a strange thing to write randomly. I think on my slank it, though, you you said something about may your, even, may your sofa always be snuggly or something. Sure. Yeah, or sure. may your feet always be warm or something. Well, you can't just write... To fix love Joe. Most people do though. This is and this is it. It's like you would never call yourself a writer, but you totally are a creative mm. writer because most people would not do that, and you do. So yeah, you. God, write clever things on your tags, people. Yeah, write clever things on your tags, people. Um, so yes, anyway, but you can like the inspiration and ideas can come from all over the place. Is my point, and so we're always doing that. But when we read like a writer, we're just a little bit more intentional about it. Mm -hmm. So rather than just kind of gathering loads of stuff, almost... Just osmotically absorbing os things. Yeah, we're just being a little bit more deliberate about it. So um, when I read something that I love, that moves me or persuades me or makes me think, then I can use that. I can make notes on it. I can study it and examine it. Mm -hmm. But hopefully not in a boring way. Because I don't. if I'm boring myself, then I don't do it. So, um, So I have a bunch of different notebooks. Um, as Joe knows, he's always finding my notebooks. Like, all over the place. All over the place. Um, and they serve different purposes. But one of them is to make notes on stuff that I find. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a, in a minute because um, I, I like to have... So one of them is that I is one that I write in most nights. I will spend a few minutes thinking about things that have happened to me during the day that might be story worthy. Mm -hmm. And I'll just scribble notes. So if Joe has been has said something particularly hilarious and mean to me, that will go in my book. Like the other day, he compared me to a, what was it, a psychotic parrotfish? To be fair, <laughs> no. you <laughs> crossed the room <laughs> snapping your teeth at me as you tried to take chocolate off me <laughs> you look mental that is not a very like... inclusive word and also that's mean okay sorry <laughs> and also i feel like you shouldn't tell people that on the podcast <laughs> um so Anyway, yes, I make notes on things that have happened during the day in my little tiny notebook. Um, There's my daily notebook. But also, so here is another thing that might sound like some kind of sac sacrilege. It's okay to write in books, but not my books. <laughs> if I've loaned them, loaned them to you, you do not write in my books. Don't write in other people's books and don't write in library books. Um, but write in your own but books. But write in your own books. Yeah, that's fine. And it took me like decades to get to this point because in my family we didn't write in books we were very careful with them and mm -hmm. you know books were sacred and all the rest of it and and I do think books are sacred and um 
you know, not to be damaged or defaced deliberately, but um, like it's okay to kind of fold pages down and it's okay to write in them if you want to. And it's really funny because I never wrote in books for so many years, but I absolutely love buying a secondhand book with notes in the margin. Right. Because you get other people's thoughts and sometimes people slip like little letters in there and hide love letters and things. And <laughs> so that's amazing. And I love that. Um, but yeah, so I love seeing what others have got from a book before it finds its way to me. And you can get new insights from other people's notes and things in, in the margin. And I read, I also use um, post-it notes as well to mark moments like that. So, sure. cause I write a lot of notes in the margins of books that I write in. And so then I'm like, oh, I need to have a way of finding them easily instead of flipping all the way through. So post-it notes are great. Um, and the, but I read somewhere and I can't, I cannot remember where I read this. Um, so if anybody knows, then let me know and I'll credit them. Um, but I read somewhere that you don't fully own a book until you've written in it yourself. And I really liked that idea because okay. you, you can kind of, you know, yeah, I don't know. You can, you can, it's just, it's just good to make notes on the ideas that you have while you have them. And in the context in which you had them. Okay. It's like archaeology, but with books. I did archaeology at college. Oh, and you see that sparked an idea for an article about archaeology and books. Hang on. Archaeological layers. Joe, talk. So Vicky is now frantically writing archaeological layers and books into her notebook, <laughs> which she will read in a couple of days' time and go, oh, I wonder what I meant then. Never mind. And do something else instead. But it was... <laughs> How dare you? Um, so yes, I and some people use highlighters. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about reading like a writer. I don't use highlighters because, and this harks back to my days of revise, revising for exams. I have no idea which information is significant and which isn't. So the whole damn thing ends up getting highlighted. You might as well just dip it in a bucket of fluorescent paint. Might as well just dip it in paint. So I have not. I don't use highlighters for that reason. Um, but if you can use highlighters like a functioning human, then go for it. <laughs> um, I did not revise well. I winged my exams and I don't honestly know how I got the grades that I did. Um, so yes, I don't highlight, but I do write notes in the margin and I underline stuff every now and then and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Um, so that's the first way that we can read like a writer. And the second thing that we can do is copy stuff out. Okay. Copy it. And I think, I don't know if we've talked about this before um, in, a, in a slightly different context, but I have a notebook specifically for copying down passages and paragraphs that I love. So if I'm reading, for example... I'm reading David Sedaris at the moment and I, was, I quite often find myself copying his stuff down. But if I, if he's written a paragraph, I'm just like, oh my God, that's just brilliant. I will write it out word for word in my notebook. Um, and then I will write a few notes about why I loved it and what it made me feel and why I think it works and the techniques the writer used and all of that kind of stuff. So I'll do a little bit of analysis and it'll just be really brief notes. Um, but I do that so that I can remember the turn of phrase and how he's put the sentence together. And so I don't want to copy what he's written because his life is different from mine. That's, you know, it would make no sense for me to copy word for word what he's written because our life experiences are so different. But I do want to know how he constructed that sentence yes. and how he constructed the paragraph and how he put his ideas together. How he, how he got his emotion across in so few words and yeah. all that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. And so I think copying stuff is really important. Um, we do it to learn how to, how to put sentences together, as I said, but also to learn how to develop our ideas as well. Because writing is thinking, writing is developing ideas. It's taking that stream of stuff out of your head and then editing it in such a way that it makes coherent sense for people. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to think really hard about it and really hard about your opinions and you learn what you think about stuff. And, yes. and so it's not always easy to do that in writing when they come, when your ideas come tumbling out of your head super fast, it can be really difficult to take them and construct them in such a way that it works for the reader. And so I think it's really useful to copy out what other people have done and figure out how they have fitted their ideas together and made them work. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. So yeah, we, I, I am a big fan of copying stuff. We copy stuff from people and we learn their voice, their techniques, their style, and then we adapt it to our own mm -hmm. um, and our own ideas. And then finally we create a style all of our own. So you might have a, mi a mishmash of, um, you know, I would love the idea of one day becoming a mishmash of like David Sedaris, Joan Didion, and a bunch of other people that I love. That would be really cool. Um, and that would be me. That would be a style all of my own. And mm -hmm. I don't know of any writer anywhere who has done it differently because that, that is how we... That's how we learn to write. I, I, you, you, one that springs to mind, I guess, would be James Joyce. But well, no, but he will have. He will have. I mean, 
but he would have drawn on other writers to produce it because he was the first one to, to develop that style of writing, that kind of stream mm. of consciousness writing. But he would have still drawn from other places and kind of created his, yeah, I guess. his way of putting things together. Um, so yes, find what you love in your genre. Um, so find writers you love in your genre. So if you want to write memoir, find some really great memoirists. If you want to write personal essays, then I would fully recommend David Sedaris and Joan Didion. Um, also Joan Didion for kind of political commentary and social commentary. Um, how to books pick a how to book that you love and, you know, read it in detail. I love James Clear's Atomic Habits. I think that's a super book, um, really well put together and well written. So yeah, um, do lots of reading and also go wider than books as well. So listen to audiobooks and podcasts because audiobooks land in a different way. Mm. You absorb them differently. You're in a different space. So figure out the techniques there because books that are written for audio are different, constructed a little bit differently than books for uh, that are written for reading. And I know that because I've done both. Sure. I've done one that is only an audiobook and I've done other books that are only um, printed books. Um, so yeah, read blogs and magazines and newspapers and watch movies and documentaries. And top tip, David Attenborough's documentaries, watch them for masterful nonfiction storytelling. Um, and if you watch his documentaries and then watch maybe other documentaries on animals and things, the other documentaries might be good. And I'm not, you know, massively knocking them, but they they won't have the quality of storytelling that David Attenborough's do. Mm. There is, for me, a noticeable difference. Um, and so pay attention to how he does it. You know, make notes while you're watching um, Blue Planet or whatever and and figure out how he has done that. Um, watch TV series and read fiction as well. Mm. Even if you're writing non-fiction, read fiction because storytelling is storytelling. So that is, yeah, that is it. That's all, this, folks. For this week. Um, what's the takeaway, Joe? It's not written down. Oh, dear. Um, read with intent. Read like a person who's trying to learn something rather than somebody who's just being entertained by the words. Yeah. Yeah. If you if you read something that moves you, make a note of it. Copy it down. Figure out why. Hmm. Try and figure out how, they've, how the writer has, has done the thing that has made you sit up and go, huh. So that is that noise. Huh. <laughs> Um, and if you would like to write your own book, then I would love to help you. Um, you could join a writing group, a three month writing group writing experience, um, specifically to get your first draft of your book written. Um, something like my Weird and Wonderful Book Society, for example, nice. which is only 10 places available. Three of them have gone already at the time of recording this, which is four days ago. Don't know if there's any spaces left find out but it's my three-month non-fiction book program that combines teaching mentoring and coaching from me group accountability co-writing sessions live group calls and feedback on your ideas and writing i ran it for the first time in the summer of 2021 and it was a thundering success i'm running it again starting the first week of december so next week um, and i would love to work alongside 10 new writers to get their books done three have three spaces have already gone two of those people are people who are returning for a second time mm -hmm. which is so exciting um, actually no i've only got six places six places left yeah three people are returning and i've got a new person signed up cool well i don't know maybe more than that hopefully by now so if you would like to join go to moxiebooks.co.uk forward slash weird and wonderful or email me vicky at moxiebooks.co.uk to find out more the links are in the show notes yeah and next week, we're going to be talking about how writing habits work. Okay. Yes. Habits. Habits. So, I think I had something else to share on the podcast this week as well, but I cannot remember what it was. Find out next week. No, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, as always, for tuning in, dear listener. We really appreciate your time and attention. And if you have enjoyed this podcast, what do they need to do? Uh, write a review, subscribe, yeah. share it with your friends. Rate it. Five stars. Yeah. And if you don't think we're worth five stars, then other podcasts are available. Um, yeah. Nice. And thank you to Podfly, as always, for beautifully producing this episode and getting rid of all of our intervening nonsense. I don't know what word I was going for. Then. There was a word in there somewhere. And thank you to Harriet for being just the bestest VA slash butler, business butler ever. Nice. She's awesome. And thank you to you, Joe. Yeah, I'm awesome too. Yeah, you are. <laughs> <laughs> thank you to you, dear listener. Right. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening. 
You can find links and show notes on the website at moxiebooks.co.uk forward slash podcast, where you can also sign up for the best daily emails in the multiverse and find loads of free resources to help you write your book. We'll be back the same time next week with more tales from the book writing trenches and the latest on what the tiny sheeps have been up to. Thank you.